Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday live stream. It's just the uh, thumbnail and title suggests we're going to take a look at uh, what's been going on with Ethereum and the Denkun upgrade. And I have to tell you, it's amazing to me just how fast we write something off in the crypto space and everything moves so quickly. But I got to tell you, this is one of those upgrades that actually did what it said it was going to do. Before we jump into all that stuff, and we talk about that. There's a couple of things uh, just to go over real quick. First of all, I just got this when I was putting up this video. I thought it was interesting of how YouTube is combating artificial intelligence and AI and everything that's going to actually happen as we roll into this next, next presidential election and everything in between. It asked me a very simple question. Does any of the following describe your content? Make a real person appear to say or do something they don't say or do? Alters footage of a real event? Generates a realistic looking scene that didn't actually occur? I think this is a good first step, but of course, people can just lie about this and go on. The question I have is, and this is the first time I've ever seen this, so I'm just giving you like a little peek behind the scenes of what's going on with YouTube. The question I have is, when people are in violation of this, will their channels be taken down? Will they have strikes against them? How many different strikes? I'm sure it's in terms of conditions. It's just interesting to me to see that. And I think it's a good thing uh, moving forward. But again, let's see if they can actually combat that because they've done pretty bad uh, with everything else as far as scams. And then also, before we talk about the Dan Kun upgrade, uh, we did a nice little show today with uh, me, Guy, and Ben, as usual, on Thursday. And we talked a lot of plethora of different things and uh, altcoins, uh, what's happening in the crypto market and where we're going from here. So I linked that in the description. Please check that out over at Coin Bureau Clips. But the story today is fees. Now, I have to tell you, I'm not a fan of Ethereum and the fees that are going on, uh, especially with layer ones. But over the last couple of uh, days, I would say, honestly, is I've been a little bit more lenient about what's happening, especially when we talked about yesterday, we took a look at uh, taking USDC from Coinbase and transferring it to a wallet. And it was uh, essentially free. It was 0.0002 or something like that, depending on what rails that you used. And if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, go take a look at the video yesterday, or you can watch uh, the NFA live show. I actually talked about that again in that video. And it makes it essentially seamless. So the whole thing comes down to is because of this Dankun upgrade. So I have to give it to the Ethereum Ethereum Foundation and what they were actually able to do. So this is what we have. And let's see, let's see, let's see down here. Enabling Dankun's near elimination of gas is a novel data storage solution called Proto Dank Sharding which is powered by blobs. This is how it all works. Blobs allow layer two data to be stored on chain for a, not forever, but a temporary period of about a month. Uh, this was uh, only previously available option, which was taking all that data, having it there forever and never having it scrubbed. And of course, when you do that, it kind of bloats everything else up as far as the chain, and then it makes it a little bit more expensive. So now they're using this blob architecture and uh, seems to be working out so far so good. And uh, this is from Aurelius BTC he says, hey, look at this. These are the fees that are going on. And I remember, you know, months ago using, I didn't use Optimism, I used Arbitrum. And uh, the fees were high. It was like 30 cents or more. I'm like, this is the future of finance. And I had to go through all these different bridges. It was ridiculous. There's a link in the description for a website called L2 Fees. And just an aggregate of all the different fees that are out there for layer twos. And uh of layer one, it also gives you Ethereum, but it has Polygon, ZK, EVM, ZK Sync Lite, and everything in between. You can see that even though, I mean, the fees are pretty low, like Optimism, StarkNet, Arbitrum, less than a penny. That's how it should be. That's how it was always supposed to be. But, you know, it uses a layer two solution now. Ethereum can't handle everything as far as layer one. Loop Ring, Polygon, DeGate, Boba Network. And you can see that even though some of these, you know, this this Dankun upgrade came out. First of all, I don't, Polygon is, I still consider it a side chain. I know people will say, well, it's a ZK roll up and it's, it's a considered an L2. Well, it hasn't really gone through that whole process. And I may be in the future, this will happen, but it's still, I mean, 27 cents, which is, you can use a, some other L1s out there and it's not even that expensive. The gate point twenty nine and so on and so forth. So I think things are working in the right direction. We'll see how it goes. And then this was a post from uh, CEO of Coinbase, Brian Armstrong. And this was, uh, hey, this is pretty big, especially for base. I mean, base is, again, a, an L2 on Ethereum. And it went from a network fee of 31 cents to zero. Well, essentially zero. It's like uh, 0.0004 or something like that. 
And then to finish up, Polygon has yet to see its gas fully drop off. We just talked about it. The mean transaction costs on network are currently hovering around 72 cents. Polygon Labs VP David Silverman said that uh, he expects all L2s, including Polygon, will be fully integrated with Dencoom within a month or two, which sounds pretty good. And then lastly, uh, most layer twos with slash gas fees have already seen dramatic increases in network activity. Daily transaction volume has more than doubled on Optimism, Base, Arbitrum, and Zora in the week since the upgrade. But it did say this, and I have to agree here. Recent gains of L2s don't appear to be at L1's detriment, at least not yet. Traffic on the Ethereum mainnet remains consistent with figures from the past year, according to this scan. Let's just pull it up real quick. So you can see that even though the transaction costs, and it's still like 10 bucks, 11 bucks, $12, somewhere around there, you can see that people are still having to use uh, Ethereum, especially if you're doing things like with certain NFTs, they're not on L2s. If you're doing certain things with like even meme coins, sometimes they're not on L2s and you have to use the Ethereum network and you're gonna pay those fees. And it's not like it's dropped off the, off the cliff, people are still using it. But that one comment in there made me think, it says here, up here, daily transaction volume has doubled. I'm like, I wonder if that's true because I never really believe anybody because that's just how I am. But uh, if you go to app.artemis.xyz, links in the description, you can take a look at uh, daily active addresses, transactions, DEX trading volume fees, price, revenue, TVL. And down here, it gives you a summary over a month. Let's, let's just change that. See, so it has period over here. Let's just change it to seven days. And this is daily active addresses. And that's, a, that's a little bit different from daily transactions, but I just wanna show you this here. Daily active addresses, that to me is, is a one of the signs of adoption. When you have a lot of active addresses moving back and forth, again, it could be bots, you got a point. But I like to see this as kind of like a gauge of what is actually happening. So we can see here that Arbitrum, a seven day change, it's up 37%. I mean, it's not the double they were talking about, but again, that's a different metric. Base is up 43%. Ethereum is st still up 16% in seven days. Optimism, 28%. And the rest are in the negative. So what does that tell you? It tells you that uh, maybe people are using L2s more than they are. I mean, Solana is down 1%. All right, you got me on that one. Sui, 18%. Nier is down 15 That's crazy. Cardano, 10 And Avalanche is down 30%. That's weird. Aptos is down 12%. Let's, uh, let's mix it up. Let's take a look at that over 30 days or a month. Now it's even more interesting, actually. Look at that. Base is now base did double in 30 days. 190, almost 200 percent Avalanche is up, Arbitrums, everything's up. What's down? Jeez Louise. Cardano is still down, negative 17%. Eh, what are you gonna do? And I'm sure all the Cardano haters are all like there, they're dancing on the grave. Hey, wait, wait, wait. It's gonna be okay if you're a Cardano holder. I'm sure they got something up their sleeve. Near is down two over the month and 84% uh, for Solana. So that's that part. And then let's take a look at daily transactions. This is one a little bit more difficult to, to read, just the way that it's uh, put out. I got to get rid of this because this is daily transactions, number of unique on-chain interactions with the protocol. Unfortunately, with this one, Solana is far and away the biggest one, but this could be votes and non-vote transactions put in together, which is a little bit funny. Uh, how they do that. It's not funny, but that's just how it is. Let's just take let's just take Solana out there because it's screwing up the whole chart. Because <laughs> it's just too many. And let's see where we're at. So Polygon, four and a half million, four point five million, same thing in the last so many days. Ethereum went from 1.2 million to 1.4. Optimism went from 585,000 the seven or eight, so it went up. Actually, everything went up. How about Cardano? Cardano went from Cardano went from fifty four thousand daily transactions to. It's not registering, sixty four. So pretty flat. So yeah, things are actually moving in the right direction. And look, on this channel yesterday, we even talked about uh, what the SEC is doing, and this has been talked about on many channels. Actually, the SEC is coming down a little bit hard on the Ethereum Foundation. They've already put out uh, probes for an investigation into if it's going to be labeled as a security. I, and of course, what happened yesterday? Well, the, the price pumped. It's like, 
And of course, there was good macro news uh, from Jerome Powell came, came coming out and being a little more dovish and being more consistent. So it doesn't really matter. In the grand scheme of things, even if Ethereum is like, okay, you're a, you're a security. So what? So now you got to go and you have to register with the SEC. Hopefully, they actually allow people to register with them and everything is fine. I think there could be a problem, again, to delve into the weeds, essentially, is if uh, they say, yeah, you're a security, come in there and register with us. And everybody has to come in, all the different exchanges, all the different projects. And they're like, okay, let us register here. And they're like, oh, yeah, here's a mountain of paperwork. And we're not going to tell you what to do. And then it just kind of collapses everything. That would be like the worst case scenario. But that's why we have Congress. Hopefully they can step up and do their job. <laughs> Anyhow, Dan, that was funny. You and I said couldn't give a straight face with that one. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that. <laughs> in the comment section. And then on top of moving from Ethereum, let's talk about tokenization of assets. This was a chart that was put out for, because RWAs or real world assets are, it's a hot topic and it's being brought at the forefront by essentially BlackRock. But did you know that old style, old school institutions are already tokenizing treasuries? And this has been going on for a year now. I was not 100% aware of this, but here it comes. Franklin Templeton, one of the oldest in the United States, uh, they have an on-chain U.S. government money fund, market cap of, I mean, a, a reasonable $300 million. And you'll see that, you know, what chains are they building on? Well, they're building on Stellar and Polygon, which essentially is a side chain or an L2 of, uh, of Ethereum. Ondo, I don't know who they are. Ethereum, Solana, Polygon, and the rest, all Ethereum. So I think when people say like they start to fade Ethereum and go, ah, it sucks and it's awful and da da da, just remember how much money is actually built on it and just think about that. Will it be the next great thing and uh, over and flip Bitcoin? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that there's a reason why I diversify and just something to think about. So this that that information was taken from this article. Tokenized U.S. Treasuries grow to almost a billion dollars in 2023. So in 2023, tokenized treasuries went from 114 million in January to 845 million by the end of the year. Let me say that again. Tokenized treasuries, U.S. treasuries, went from 114 million in January to 845 million in the year. That's a 641% growth within one year. And these are just the people that are doing it now. They're the first ones. No one wants to be first, but nobody wants to be last. So I see this only continuing, especially with RWAs, especially with BlackRock coming in, but we'll see. So I like this. This is actually good for my Ethereum bag, <laughs> but we'll see how it all goes over time and uh, see which one actually wins. And then finally, just to talk about uh, number one, which we which will be Bitcoin. There was a good piece that was put out. This is by uh, Cointelegraph. And it states Bitcoin ETF makes a, a honeypot for hackers and government. This is from the CEO of Trezor, and his name is Matej Zak. I'm pretty sure I nailed that. And it's it's something that I, that I was thinking about, and somebody actually put it on the on a paper or actually wrote it up. So I thought it'd be interesting. So it states here that uh, according to Mr. Zak, there are currently 420 million global exchange users. Think about this: there's 420 million global centralized exchanges users and only 8 million self custody that's 2% 2% of people i apparently am talking to myself when i'm telling everybody the third rule underneath me which says 0% exchanges don't leave anything on exchanges and i know when people tell me rob you're a dinosaur and uh you know this this whole thing that happened with Mt. Gox and with Celsius and with Voyager and FTX and BlackFi <laughs> and fill in the blank will never happen again. We're fine. We're going to be good. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. And nobody cares. And that's why I can't help everybody. So I'm glad that all the tourists aren't here. Thank you for showing up. I'm sure you're doing the same thing. Don't leave them on exchanges. This is ridiculous. And this is part of the reason why. With the current major inflow of capital into spot ETFs, Coinbase is likely to become the largest Bitcoin honey pack, honeypot, attracting hackers, social engineers, and other attackers in volumes never seen before. This is again from the CEO of Trezor. 
These bad actors may not be the highest risk in the case. The, ma the major threat has come from governments that may be tempted to confiscate Bitcoin stored at Coinbase in whole or in part. Those specific taxes are simply just by legislating and confiscating. So there's two parts here. If you don't know, Coinbase essentially is the custodian for eight out of the 10 uh, Bitcoin spot ETFs. It's the big one. And they are holding all of the Bitcoin. Hopefully they don't do something crazy and screw something up. I'm sure they won't, but I'm just saying, if there is a screw up or if there is a hack or something happens, even if they have cold storage, I get it, I get it. But I'm just saying, it scares me that it's just in one centralized place. They have everything right there. And then the governments could come in. I mean, there's one part on hackers. And the second part is, of course, confiscation by government. This is what the whole reason why we're into crypto and digital assets. Just saying. And then people would say, wow, that's just some crazy nut over on Trezor just pumping his own product. But as a reminder, in 1933, FDR had an executive order 6102. What does that mean? They said, look, we've got a lot of problems in the United States. They confiscated the citizens' gold because the federal... And let me ask you, oh, as I read this sentence, if this reminds you of anything going on right now. It might. They confiscated citizens' gold because federal debt was out of control <laughs> and the geopolitical headwinds were blowing in an uncertain future. So if that reminds you of anything, uh, that could be that. So it's just something to think about. I know people will say like, uh, you know, you're being a little bit too worried, just relax. I can't relax because I'm a worrier and that's that's how it goes. Anyhow, let me know what you think. And then lastly, um, ETFs are slowing down for some reason. So this is a piece that was put out by Cointelegraph. I'll just go through this real quick. The three day net outflows was 742 million. That's a lot. Uh, ETFs has now marked their third straight day of total net outflows. Obviously, we don't have the data for right now because, you know, the day is not over. It's uh, three o'clock in Puerto Rico time, which is Atlantic Standard Time, which is the same as Eastern Center, I guess. But the outflow was due mainly to per grayscale as usual, which bled $386 million. And over the last three days, it's been quite a bit. See here, grayscale, grayscale from the 15th, no, excuse me, 18th, 19th, and 20th. The outflow was 642 million, 443 million, 386 million. And the inflows, I mean, from one of the big ones, BlackRock was only, who had zero? One, two, BTCO and EZBC. Well, good enough. BlackRock has inflows of uh, 451, one of the saviors, but then 75 and 49. And of course, outflows are pretty, but generally speaking, uh, we are still up uh, quite a bit as far as like the total. Looks like we're at uh, 13 billion. Uh, no, no, excuse me, 11 billion uh, total inflows. And that's from taking, and just take a look at uh, BlackRock at I, or IBIT, 13 billion inflows, 13 billion, eight, nine. Grayscale outflows, 13 billion, 271. It's like they're fighting for for jockeying for position. That's what it is. So hopefully we can uh, still see that, but it reminds me of, uh, of a thing, which is, you know, we all talked about, oh, ETF is going to change everything and it's going to just going to keep happening. And of course, there's going to be massive inflows and then we'll see some more people. Again, it takes time. It takes time for adoption to happen. It takes time for people to actually get it, but we'll see how it goes. That's why I probably cost average diversify. That's it for today. So look, everybody, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. We're going to talk about it's time sensitive.